Welcome to Question Time, and tonight, we're in Wigan. And on our panel here, the man in charge of Brexit, the Secretary of State for exiting the EU, the Conservative David Davis, Labour's Shadow Business Secretary, Rebecca Long-Bailey, the leader of UKIP, Paul Nuttall, the leader of Plaid Cymru, Leanne Wood, and the boss of Siemens UK, Jürgen Meyer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And just before we start, remember, you can join in these debates. Uh, Twitter, our hashtag is BBCQT. On Facebook, search for BBC Question Time. Or if you want to text 83981, press the red button. You'll see what others are saying. Our first question tonight comes from Mark Buckley, please. Mark Buckley. Considering the recent rhetoric coming from Europe, do we need a bloody difficult woman to negotiate Brexit? <laughs> Well, before we come to the politicians, Jürgen Meyer, do we need a bloody difficult woman to negotiate Brexit? Well, I think what we need above all is we need a little bit more calm and we need a little bit more uh, rational uh, debate. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, it can't get difficult and, you know, and clearly there are going to be difficult players on both sides. But in the end, what's going to get us through these very important and very difficult negotiations is if both sides just spend more time understanding each other's position. And that also means that we in the UK have to spend much, much more time understanding where is the EU coming from on this. We have to understand our, our side. And when we do that, we've got a chance of getting a good deal and we damn well need to get a good deal. <laughs> So, uh, so, as an outsider to this, was the Prime Minister right to say on the steps uh, uh, to the BBC that the next person to find out she's a bloody difficult woman would be Jean-Claude Juncker? I mean, was that a sane, sensible thing to say, or was that provocative in the way you don't want to see the negotiations conducted? Well, you know, the way that I see it is, is you know, we're, we're in an election, you know, and uh, we've had a week where uh, emotions just, uh, just ran uh, a little bit high. And I guess, you know, it is to be expected that at this point you get a bit of positioning. That's what you get in tough negotiations. But I'm pretty confident that, uh, you know, when we, after the elections and we get into the real debate, you know, I think it will be what's right for the country, not what's right for your own political party, okay. and, uh, and we'll get some calm and we'll get some uh, proper debate, right. I hope. Rebecca Long-Bailey. <laughs> well, look, I think the uh, displays that we've seen over the last 48 hours have been very worrying, suggesting quite an unstable approach taken by the Prime Minister. What's even more worrying is that she was using the EU as an electioneering tool, one of the biggest decisions this country has had to make. And even more worrying than that were the comments that we'd heard had been made by Juncker. He said that at the recent meeting she wasn't fully briefed. Apparently Angela Merkel had said that she lived in another galaxy in terms of the things that she was putting forward. But Ultimately, what we need to see now is a government that puts collaboration and patriotism at the heart of our Brexit negotiations so that they get a deal for the many, not the few, and turn us into a tax haven, which is what the threats that we've had from Philip Hammond. And we also need patriotism in terms of British industry. We want to see the government giving industry the tools that it really needs to succeed. For example, we asked the government to provide support for reshoring UK supply chains to make sure that manufacturing was brought back to this country and it brought down costs for businesses here. But the government seems intent on offering bespoke deals to one or two businesses and leaving the rest to rot. Now, that is not a real industrial strategy. We asked them to plug the skills gap to make sure that businesses had the skills and we had a high-skilled workforce ready to go, but they cut the adult skills budget by 1.36 billion. OK, now, before we get examples. into too many details, we'll come to some of that, but let's just deal with the question of attitude. Um, and uh, uh, the Prime Minister said she's a bloody difficult woman, quoting what Ken Clark said about her. Uh, would Jeremy Corbyn be a bloody difficult man 
negotiating Brexit? Well, I think you need to have a mixture of being very robust and pursuing the needs that your country has alongside a, a, an air of winning friends and influencing people, shall I say. And Theresa May certainly hasn't displayed right. the charisma that we need to negotiate our way through these talks. Okay. <laughs> David Davis. Well, let's go back to the start of this. There was a dinner. I was at the dinner. Uh, I'm not going to tell you much about it because it, it was supposedly private, but there was at the dinner. And what came out afterwards was not a leak. It was a misleading briefing, a deliberately misleading briefing to position the uh, commission in one position and trying to undermine the position of the British government. And uh, the response to that by the government, by the Prime Minister, was we simply said, we don't recognise this. That was all. It was very polite. And for 48 hours, we stuck to that. Why? Because exactly the point that Rebecca's making. We want to keep this stable and calm and sensible so we get an outcome that's good for both sides. And that's been our stance all the way through. But then we had further briefings. We're going to have to pay 100 billion. We're going to, you know, the Prime Minister will not be able to negotiate. And eventually we got to the point where the line was crossed. I mean, clearly what was happening was the Commission was trying to bully the British people. And the British people will not be bullied. And the government will not allow them to be. So she made the point she made, and she was right to do so. Now, at the end of this, what we're aiming for is a very good deal. Jorgen's point, a very good deal for the British people, a very good deal for the British people, based on what they voted on in the referendum, taking back control of our laws and borders and money, and delivering a comprehensive free trade agreement to, prevent, to protect all of business, Rebecca, not just parts of it, and give us the security that we need, that we have currently with the Justice and Home Affairs. And so for all those reasons, we're very lucky we've got a bloody difficult woman. And I think we are very good. <laughs> a lot of hands up. Let me just hear from one or two members of our audience before we go. Yes, you there. Me? Yeah. I think it's a bit rich, Rebecca, you're sat there saying Theresa May wasn't fully briefed after Labour's performance on reeling out some of their policies this week. <laughs> okay, and, and you here on the right. It just seems to me she said that phrase as a device in the general election to make sure all the people that want Brexit and want a hard Brexit vote for her. She's not said that device to actually help us negotiate with the That's EU. Right. And you said at the back there. Let's hear a bit more from our audience. Yes, you said in the very yeah, back. To, yes. To, to me, the statement she came out with just actually shows a lack of negotiating skills. I thought, I thought negotiation was people sitting around the table and trying to achieve the best outcome for all parties. She's, she's, she's adopting Donald Trump's tactics, and we know what Donald Trump, Trump does to negotiate. He goes and drops a big ball on somebody. We don't want that. It won't work now with the EU, that. But what about um, the EU Commission President saying Brexit can't be a success and she's living in another galaxy? That's quite aggressive, too. And she's living in another galaxy, maybe. Oh, she is living in another galaxy. For many other reasons, for many other reasons. But she doesn't actually say anything of substance. She just comes out with sound bites all the time. All the time. And, and it's, it's Goebbels, isn't it? Goebbels okay. said, what was it? Uh, a lie told often enough becomes the truth. And we all know Goebbels is politics, don't we? OK. Dear me. You, you, you sit up there. Can, can Theresa May deliver on Brexit? Because she's never delivered on a promise in her life, as far as I can see. <laughs> All right, well, David Davis, a, a brief answer to you, then I'll go to the other members of the panel who haven't spoken. Well, never delivered on a promise. She was Home Secretary over six years, in which uh, crime came down by 30%. I think that's a pretty good promise. Uh, pretty good delivery. Uh, and... and... And, 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 wait a minute, and the, other, and the point about the negotiator, the man was saying up there, you know, you have to uh, accept in this process that there will be difficult times. I've said a dozen times in House of Commons, there will be times in this when it will get tough, when they will try to test out our patience, our willingness to, uh, to play the game. The, the real skill <coughs> in negotiations is finding the area where both sides benefit. What Jürgen does every day in his business, where both sides benefit. Well, that's what we've done. We've said we want the European Union to succeed. 
We've said we will be a good European citizen, even though we're not in the European Union. We've said we want a free trade deal to help everybody, not just the one. That's what a good negotiator does, and that's what we're <coughs> going to deliver on. Leon Wood. Thank you. Leanne. I think this was more to do with the election than to do with the EU negotiations, and I think it's irresponsible to use uh, something like this, as big as this and important as this, uh, as an election uh, issue. I... Well, of course, she said I'd... they were trying to interfere yeah. in the British election. Well, do you think that? I, I, I don't uh, accept that, if I'm honest. I think that um, she's uh, trying to approach this with a, quite an aggressive uh, attitude. It's the wrong attitude. It's not the attitude that's going to get the best deal. She needs to be much more open-minded, and I think this is quite uh, an English nationalist uh, approach. And um, Rebecca talked earlier about the need for patriotism. Well, it's quite clear that Theresa May is speaking on behalf of, of England. That's clear to me. Um, we've That's got why the she's ten percent ahead of Wales, in Wales, then. Huh? Well, she's the speaking... leading party in Wales is now the Conservative Party. Well, if you're referring to a, a, a poll that came out mm. recently, let's wait and see the next poll yeah. because there are big questions of, as to the veracity. Yeah, let's wait and see the result. That. Even better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's wait and see the result tonight <laughs> after the local elections, um, shall we? But if we're talking about patriotism, we've got Theresa May speaking on behalf of English nationalism. The SNP speak on behalf of Scotland. What Wales needs now is someone to speak on behalf of Wales. We've been ignored and neglected as a country through all of this process, and it's vital now that in this election, Wales sends a large team of Plaid Cymru MPs to Westminster to defend the Welsh national interest, because at the moment our needs are getting completely ignored in all of this. <coughs> the woman there in blue. In blue, when you say... Um... She's amazing. She's a bloody difficult woman. All she's doing is a smoke screen to bring in more austerity. If she does win the general election, it's I going agree, to be yeah. more cuts, more I austerity. Agree. And everybody will vote for that. And privatisation. Privatisation as well. Paul, Paul Nuttall. Uh, well, remember, remember the question Mark asked. Do we need a bloody difficult woman to negotiate Brexit? Well, on Theresa May's record, um, I would say that she's... A failure, actually. You look at her record as Home Secretary. This was the Home Secretary who said that she would get <coughs> the numbers of people coming to this country down to the tens of thousands. Last year it was a city the size of Newcastle upon Tyne. So her record isn't that great. Uh, what, I, what we do need is someone who will go into these negotiations and actually be prepared to walk away. Walk away if we don't get the deal we want. Because... <laughs> Because, frankly, no deal is better than a bad deal. Now... You're quoting you know, her, but, but, aren't you, when no, you say No, 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 no. That's what she But the difference is, I mean it. I don't think ah. she does. You know, Frank, the EU is showing its true colours here. Within a space of 48 hours, our divorce bill went from 50 billion to 100 billion. OK? Now, they're on dodgy legal ground with this anyway, but we shouldn't be paying a divorce bill into an organisation whereby we have given it, in membership fees alone, £183 billion since 1973. We've got £9 billion tied up in the European Investment Bank. We own some of the EU's real estate. They've got £156 billion pounds worth of real estate across Europe. We should not be paying any divorce bill to this organisation. Let's remember who we are. We're Great Britain, we're the seventh largest economy in the world, and the Prime Minister should go into these confident that she can get the best deal All right. possible. Fine. Let's... Um... Let's, let's stick with this, but maybe we'll come back to what went on at, at number 10 Downing Street, because David Davis began describing it. But Robert Langley, let's just have your question, please. How much is too much? 50 billion, yep. 60 billion, or 100 billion? <laughs> David Davis. Well, they're all too much. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> So what is, I'm, what is I'm, enough? No, no, no. I'm not, no I'm not, David, I'm not going to do the negotiation here. The aim of this exercise, remember, is to get a successful outcome, not just to talk about the successful outcome. I mean, in a way, Paul Nuttall's point. Uh, and we are determined to get a successful outcome for everybody. But the, the, the point he raised is actually a very good one. That in the course of this exercise, which Leanne thought was perfectly uh, reasonable behaviour, 
uh, by the European Union. They upped the ante from 50 to 100 with no reason whatsoever except as an intimidation play in a negotiation. So we're not going to get into debating that. We're going to say that we want to talk about uh, free trade because that's beneficial to both sides. The history of the European Union is trying to make other countries pay for the privilege of trading with them when free trade is beneficial to both sides. Remember, they sell 290 billion to us, we sell 230 billion to them. So Paul's right, we have a strong hand, that's where we start. Okay. Um, I find it laughable that the Conservatives are commenting on the Brexit campaign and commented on how much we have to pay to exit the European Union when they were the ones who actually said this is how much money we're going to give back to the NHS and the result of that. Where is that money, David? Mm. Or is it just this that you're complaining about? Okay. Let's just... We may, we may, we may come to the NHS uh, later on in, in the, in the programme. So just to hold that for a moment, but, um, Rebecca Long-Bailey. Well, look, I think we're living in cloud cuckoo land if we think we're going to get away without paying anything at all. I don't know what the exact figure is going to be, but this highlights the importance of having a still skillful negotiator on our side in the form of a prime minister, somebody that can negotiate our obligations down. I'd highlight the importance of making sure that we adhere to our obligations because let's remember we're going to be making trade deals across the world and we have to look like a partner that keeps up our side of the bargain otherwise nobody will want to sign any free trade agreements with us. But I also want to go back to a point David made about trusting Theresa May and he talked about uh, policing and how crime has fallen. In the last year, violence against the person has increased by 19%. That's the highest number on record. Let's look at some of the other obligations hang and on, promises Hang on, hang on. Let's look made. at the question I asked you, which was, what is Labour's position on the 50, 60 or 100 billion? Because well, you say, can talk about Theresa May till the cows come home, but people want to know what well, Labour, we need Labour to, thinks We need too. to ensure we are in a strong position to negotiate and we need to make sure that we win friends and influence people and we use our leverage. Of course, but do you have any sure idea of the kind of figure that would be acceptable? Well, would, would 100 billion be acceptable? Well, as I say, it's all part of the negotiations. Oh, so 100 might be acceptable. Well, David, is 100 billion acceptable? What figure have I you said that you're going to set it? as a benchmark? What's your minimum amount? Well, you, you want me to give a minimum amount here? That's a very good uh, tactic in negotiation. The announcement up front, yeah, <laughs> really clever. Which I'm afraid is a demonstration. Labour have had six different positions on this in the course of the last nine months. Uh, and you're, you've got to make a decision. It's a decision not just on what's said publicly, it's a decision in personality and trust. Do you trust Theresa May to do this, or no. do you trust Jeremy Corbyn to do this? And that's the decision okay. the British people but, but will make. But come back to money. You poured scorn on the upping from 50 to 100 billion. Yeah. You would treat 100 billion as beyond the pale. Uh, would look, you? Yes. I, yes, yes, fine. Yes, that's yes, all I want to know. So you, do, you are putting down a benchmark. Jürgen Meyer. Yeah, well, you know, I think you know, we're in danger of, of having. You know, the wrong conversation here. At the end of the day, I think there is going to be a fee to be paid. We don't know what that is going to be. David Davies, you've said yourself there are some liabilities that we have put upon the EU. There are some support programmes that the EU has made with us being part of them. So therefore, we have to pay for that for a period of time. Is that 50, 100 billion? We don't know. But what I would like to hear much more about is what is the vision for this country outside of the EU? Because, because once we have decided what that vision is, it might just make the fact that we have to make some contribution a little bit more palatable. For example, we definitely do want to continue to have a relationship with the EU about security. We probably want to have a relationship about climate change. We probably want to continue to participate in some research programmes. I am not here arguing any way that we want to stay part of the single market, but there are certain areas. So let's have a vision for those, describe them, and then we can get onto a conversation of how much we really owe. Thank you. And, well, on that point, David Davis, yes. And, and, and Jürgen is exactly right, and that's something that Theresa has made very plain. The vision here is a global Britain, a Britain that trades with the whole world. Remember, nearly 60% of our trade now is with other parts of the world, most of which we don't have a free trade agreement with. So in the next few years, we are going to be developing the basics of free trade agreements with the fastest growing parts of the world. 
you know, the, the, the uh, uh, Indian subcontinent, uh, Asia, Oceania, the yeah. areas where actually but Wales is selling most of the But don't forget that. 44% of our trade is still yeah, with the at EU, the moment, vitally of course, important of course, to our British businesses, and we need to find a way and, to get a good deal. And that's the point. That's the point about the comprehensive free trade agreement. It's designed to protect what we have whilst freeing us up to actually develop markets everywhere else in the world. And we have a fabulous advantage. Right. We've got the English language, we've got the culture, we've got the Commonwealth. All the things on our side. So there's a real vision for a great future for this country so what, if we negotiate this properly. Okay. Uh, The danger is that it'll be like TTIP, the, 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 deal, the okay. trade deal with America that was rejected, which risked opening up the NHS to privatisation, yeah. and the Tories have failed to guarantee not opening up the, uh, 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 the NHS to the market. All right, but this coming to the NHS a, later, as I said, you. I want to go to members of the audience, but David Davis, you began talking a little bit about the dinner party at number 10. It was reported that the President of the EU Commission said Brexit cannot be a success and that Theresa May was living in another galaxy. Well, I'm not going to... did he say that? And what did, what did it mean? Well, I mean, it well, doesn't sound very promising when well, you... At the I'm, start I'm, of I'm, 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 I'm not going to talk about the dinner party, as you call it, uh, because, you know, it was a it private meeting. It wasn't a party, even. Know, it wasn't well, even a dinner. It was very convivial. As you saw, if you watched when they came out, everybody was joking and laughing together. So, it was, you know, a, lot of, a lot of this uh, briefing has been nonsense. But you know, the point you made about his comment about it cannot be Brexit a success... Cannot be, yeah. It cannot be a success. Early on in this process, immediately after the referendum. There was talk about punishing Britain. Then they realised that was perhaps not particularly acceptable to, to British people. And then they talked instead about not it, Britain cannot be allowed to do better outside and inside. Frankly, that's not for them to decide. How we do outside is down to us as an independent nation standing on our own two feet. Don't you want uh, to and try and okay. have a good relationship right. I want to hear from you. The, the woman in green there. The, the woman, woman in green there, yes. You, you know, yes. Um, Let's hear your views. With, with all these billions um, being mentioned, with the French election and the possible Marine Le Pen getting in, um, you know, if there's a referendum and they come out and they do a Frexit, now what I'm wondering is, well, if it's a domino effect, is it the last man standing gets all the money? Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you, and you, you and you, you sound blue. Yes. Yes, you. I'm, I'm a little tired of listening to uh, a, ba a bad Brexit and, a, and a, a soft and a hard Brexit. Why don't we just let these guys get on with it? it it's all we hear is, is rhetoric in, in the newspaper, on the television. That's all we get. Yeah. We, in a month's time, we're going to have a confirmation of, of a negotiating team. Let them get on with it and we'll see where it takes us in two years. So time. we should stop talking about it? Well, mean? not stop talking about it, but hard and soft. You know, the rhetoric isn't doing us any good. OK. You, sir? I think the fact that the EU is asking for any money for Britain undertaking a democratic exercise is frankly ridiculous, and it shows that we're dealing with bloody difficult men. Right. Leanne Wood, 50 billion, 60 billion, 100 billion. That was the question that Robert asked. Well, that's like asking, in a divorce settlement, before you go to court, um, does one partner get half the house, a quarter of the house, a third of the house? I mean, the point of negotiation is to be like adults, to sit around a table and to try and sort things out uh, without acrimony. And going into these negotiations with the attitude that the Prime Minister has got all superior, we are better than them over there in Europe, is the wrong way to go about it. The only people that will end up with all the money uh, in, in all of this are the lawyers, like they do in, in a real divorce. So there is a bill to pay. We've been part of a club. We've made financial commitments. We have to honour those commitments. We don't know how much that will be yet. But we do know that that promise of £350 million that was on that bus that they said would go to the NHS every week, that is the figure that they rode back on straight away. And many people that I know in the constituency that I represent back in Wales are desperate to see money go back into the NHS. All right, and I... they voted for Brexit mm. on the basis of a lie. OK. Uh, you, sir. Yes. <clears throat> 
I, th I think what we're forgetting is that David Cameron proved beyond any doubt it's the EU who won't negotiate. Uh, he came back saying he got a good deal. He got nothing. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, Mr. Davies, not one penny. <laughs> All right. And, and I'll take a couple more points and then I want to move on. Yes, the woman there on the gangway. I'll come to you waving at me. Not because you're waving, but because you've had your hand up for a bit. You, you, you madam, there. I think at the end of the day, you're able to try to make an example out of Britain to prevent other member states doing exactly what we've done and having their own, their own Brexit. Yeah, so you think it'll be difficult? Hang on. Uh, and and uh, where was the person with the tattoos? Yes, you said. Until a professional outside body yeah. adds up both assets and liabilities, who can have any idea what exactly. the bill can be? Exactly. Okay, Paul Nuttall, yeah, briefly, I, if you would. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the, the interesting quote of the week is from Juncker when he said that Brexit cannot be a success. And the reason why he's saying that is because they are terrified. Because if Brexit is a success and we are a beacon of light for the rest of the European Union, then France will go next, then Sweden will go, then Denmark will go, and the whole thing will begin to break up. And as for... As for going into these negotiations, we can be confident. We have a huge trade and deficit with the European Union. In many ways, they need us more than we need them. There's six million jobs on the continent which are dependent on British trade. Now, this might be a devious organisation, it might be a bullying organisation, but it isn't a stupid organisation. And I think people like David can go into these negotiations confident that we can get right. a really good deal for the British okay. people. Right. We We've had questions on other topics. I want to go on to some of them. Just to say before I do, next week we're going to be in Edinburgh, and the week after that we're in Norwich. Edinburgh and then Norwich. The details of how to apply are on the screen, and I'll repeat them at the end. Now, here's a topic we've had a number of questions on. Laura Pimblett, please. Let's have your question. Uh, why is the media refusing to portray Jeremy Carbon in a positive light? Why is the media... In case you missed it, why is the media refusing to portray Jeremy Corbyn in a positive light? David Davis. Well, I'm afraid they're reflecting a view, not just of the media, but of three quarters of the Labour Party, who passed a vote of no confidence in him last year. My own opposite number, uh, Keir Starmer, who's the shadow Brexit secretary, resigned last year, and the words he gave were uh, because he didn't think that Jeremy Corbyn could provide the leadership uh, to negotiate a decent deal uh, on Brexit. So I'm afraid what they're reflecting is a commonly held view. Now look, I'm, I, I, I actually like Jeremy Corbyn. I took him to Washington with me when we got the release of the last uh, uh, British resident in Guantanamo Bay and he was helpful on that. But I'm, afra I'm afraid in terms of actually leading a country, in terms of delivering on a government, in terms of making decisions, Brexit alone, six different positions in nine months, uh, he simply hasn't proved able to do the job, and that's what the media reflects. Look, <laughs> Laura, what's, what's your complaint, Laura, about the media? Uh, the, no, no one is listening to his policies, and all the Conservatives seem to be doing is, like, like, portraying him in a negative light. They're not doing their own thing, they're just abusing him. And is that the papers or radio, television, everything? Just a lot, isn't there? There's nothing. Nothing else? Um, Jürgen Maher, would you? <clears throat> well, you know, I'm, I'm in business and, uh, and, and my role is not to take political sides. You know, I see my role as working with uh, whichever political party to uh, help create a strong uh, uh, British uh, economy. You know, I think uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn is, is clearly a man of, uh, of strong uh, conviction. Um, I think in terms of business, um, you know, what I would like to see is... Uh, you know, a little bit less um, of the, uh, you know, business is, uh, is nasty and, uh, you know, you, you don't all pay your taxes. You know, of course, we know there are incidents of that, but the truth is that, you know, business is a huge value creator. You know, we pay actually as business, when you take our corporation tax, national insurance, all those tax, three quarters of all of the taxes raised by the country is generated through business. We're a very important engine uh, of the economy and, uh, and I'd like to see a little bit more partnership but um, do, of how we can work together yeah, but the and, question and Laura's an economic asked, growth. The yeah. question is, Laura says that the media are being unfair to Jeremy Corbyn, that they have a down on him. Do you think that's true? 
Um, no, that's, uh, you know, I think the media, you know, will just pick up and, uh, you know, anything which, uh, which sells a good story and at the end of the day, you know, I think our audience here today and the British population is uh, intelligent to, uh, to see through that and, uh, and to make their own decisions based on the policies and based on the manifestos and not what you're reading in the Daily okay. Mail. <coughs> Leanne Wood. <coughs> Well, I think that the right and the far right are on the march, not just here uh, in the UK, but in other parts of the EU as well and in America. And I think the media are reflecting that. And anyone who's not on the right or the far right seems to be getting it. My colleague Nicola Sturgeon is getting a hard time uh, as well. She's been... <laughs> She's been described as one of the most difficult women in politics, and I think part of, uh, part of that is around the way the media portray her. I'd like to see a more balanced media, more balanced ideas. I think social media can help with some of that because it's not going through a filter. But I don't think the leader of the Labour Party is helping himself by refusing to participate in the electoral TV debates if the Prime Minister doesn't turn up. I think they should be both empty chaired if they don't show. But what they're doing by refusing to turn up is turning down that platform to put across uh, your policy ideas, reducing the range of opinion available to people. There are large numbers of people who watch those television debates that might not access politics in any other way. And I think it's important for democracy that they go ahead with the full range of opinion that's available. Okay. Um, I'd like to say, as a, I voted in the last um, general election, I'm voting in this general election. And I'd like to say, um, Jeremy Corbyn really turned my head to politics. He speaks about what's real. I don't think it's a case of the press being against him. I think it's just a case that no one's reporting what Labour's actually standing for. People are voting for personalities and lies rather than um, promises. And it's really sad. Thank you. Um, Rebecca Long Bailey, the, the question is the media refusing to portray Jeremy Corbyn in a positive light, but you might just pick up first on what Leanne said about he's not doing himself much of a service or politics by refusing to debate with other party leaders. What's your view of well, that? Well, I mean, I'll be honest, I think it's been a struggle in the media, certainly since Jeremy was elected leader of the party. I think the media have focused on divisions and people arguing with people within the party rather than actually reporting on our policies. And we've got a fight on our hands in this election. We're fighting for every single vote. And whilst Theresa May is refusing to do TV debates and having staged managed events where she only invites Tory party supporters, Jeremy is on the stomp all around the country delivering our policies and showing mm. how he will transform Britain because this election is a choice. It's about having a Britain for the many, which is what the Labour Party believes in, where wealth and prosperity is shared. <laughs> or it's a Tory Britain that only looks after a privileged few. And to come back on the point about business, do you know, it breaks my heart to hear you say that because we've been fighting to get our business message out there. We were at the front of the queue when it came to business rates. We were talking about how businesses were really being pushed to the edge of a cliff. We asked for manufacturing industries and other industries to be given uh, support in the exemption of plant and machinery to grow their businesses because we think that government and business in collaboration can deliver the future that Britain needs. It will deliver the high-paid, high-skilled economy that these people need. Yeah. Oh, you, sorry, you didn't, you, didn't answer, you didn't answer why he won't debate, even though Theresa May isn't there in the studio. Why won't he debate with the other party leaders? to get his ideas across? Well, I think Jeremy, having Theresa May taken the decision that she's taken, he felt that it was necessary to go out and meet the people and develop his policies and discuss them with the general public and uh, try it's and get It's not one or the out. other. You can do the two. I'll be doing both. I'll well, be going out meeting the people I think and... We're, we're the official opposition. Debates. We're the only chance of getting rid of this Tory party. And Jeremy oh, felt that in order to get a fair hearing, he needed to have a debate with Theresa May. So if Theresa May comes to these debates, and I agree she should, because I think the British public deserve to hear what she's got to say, and she needs to be held to account, then Jeremy will be there as well. All right. You. Yes, politicians need to stop the mudslinging. Um, it, they, they quote this week, mutton-headed old mudwump, does nobody any favours, it grabs headlines. 
But what it does do is it sets a bad example to children. We tell them not to bully, and yet you're bullying each other. In the midst of all this, we're losing the debate about the policies because the, the press are just picking up on the mudslinging backwards and forwards. There's nothing reported about the policies, and we need to hear the policies in an adult, grown-up conversation and debate. Stop okay. those debates are important. Um, important. Yes, you're on the, on the gangway, yes. Without debate, there can't be any scrutiny. Exactly. Now, exactly. Theresa May has refused to debate Jeremy Corbyn. Silly sound bites are no match against honesty and integrity. Right. Right. But, do you think Is that yeah. why yeah. Mrs May will not debate with Jeremy Corbyn on but TV? She will. Because she does not have any policies. But she will, on the other hand, as far as we know at this stage, and it's not certain, debate with a question time audience. So she will argue her that case with you, and you, and you, and you. No. Why won't she debo debate Corbyn then? Mm. Okay, I don't know the answer to that one. Thank you. <laughs> you said in the middle. Yeah, yes. I think uh, my concern, uh, and I think a lot of people in the country, we like to see Jeremy Corbyn because he will answer a question. All I've seen of Theresa May is dodge, dodge, dodge. She hasn't answered anything directly. I mean, the BBC interview the other day. I, why can't we have politicians that will give us a direct answer, like Jeremy Corbyn? Um, cool. Yeah, um, do you know, I sort of feel sorry for Jeremy Corbyn, I have to say. I think he's a, an honourable and principled man. I disagree uh, with his principles. And the problem that he's got is, although the press or the, the media are plunging the knife in his chest, his own party are plunging the knife in his back all the time. So he goes on... <laughs> So, he, goes, he goes on television and they're in an awful muddle, you know, to talk about something like Trident and then he's being contradicted about an hour later by other members of his shadow cabinet. The problem that you've got with Labour at the moment is that it is completely split. Uh, you've, got the Blair, the, you've, got, you've got the Blairites who want rid of Corbyn, you've got Corbyn himself who is in effect a throwback to a bygone era, but at least with Corbyn you've got a clear choice in this election because unfortunately what happened with politics during the Blairite era is that everyone rushed to the centre. I mean, there's a clear choice with Jeremy Corbyn uh, as leader of the Labour Party and I've mentioned Tony Blair, you know, you can give me ten Jeremy Corbyns over any Tony Blair any day. Okay. We've, got, we've got many, many more questions. Let's go to another one. Uh, Wendy Doherty, please. Wendy Doherty. The use of food banks has dramatically increased under this Tory government. Should we hang our heads in shame that as one of the richest countries in the world, people are queuing for food? Um, Jürgen, would you like to start on that? Yeah, well, I mean, the answer is, is uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a, a real, quite a tragic uh, situation, isn't it, that uh, um, we've not been able to uh, raise living standards and we have more in-work poverty um, than we have had before. Um, however, you know, we need to find a solution uh, to that. And this is definitely an issue where, you know, we need to really raise above party politics. And there is a really, really fundamental issue here and that is that we have for decades actually not focused on what is it that generates wealth in this country. And one of the key things that generates wealth is manufacturing, it's high technology industries which export, which create high value jobs, which creates productivity and through those mechanisms, we can actually raise wages, we can raise living standards. And we have not had a strategic approach for that, which has to be long term, so it has to be across governments for a very, very long time. And we need a much, much stronger focus on that. And only through that can we start raising living standards again. When, when did Doherty, David Davis put it very vividly, shouldn't we hang our heads in shame that in one of the richest countries in the world people are queuing 
for free food. I know nobody, nobody is comfortable uh, with the idea of using food banks. Do um, something about but wait, it. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me let me, let me pick up on on Jürgen's point because he because he has a point that uh, in the Western world we have to think much harder, be more agile about encouraging business, encouraging wealth creation. Uh, and that's what Theresa May, actually one of the unique things about her in terms of a leader of the Tory party, is she believes in industrial strategy. Yeah. She believes in creating the foci for development, the innovation, the research, uh, apprenticeships, all of these things central to her approach to conservatism. So at one end, you have that. You can't do it without the wealth creation. At the other end, the thing that brings people out of poverty is not, at the end of the day, welfare, it's jobs, it's work. It's getting out to do a job, it brings self-respect, it brings money, and we've got 2.8 million more people in work today than we had when we came into power. The highest level of employment ever in our country and the lowest level of unemployment for over a decade. Okay. For over a decade. All right, and, so, and with it, and with it, the living wage. All right, the, the, when, when uh, the Prime Minister appeared on Andrew Marr's programme, uh, he quoted to her the Royal College of Nursing, mm. saying that nurses were even turning to food banks, employed nurses were even turning to food banks. And her reply was, there are many complex reasons why people... What did that mean? Well, she's Presumably right, I mean, people go to food banks because they're hungry. People have short-term cash issues, I mean, all sorts of things. You, the, the complexity of individual people's lives is important, you know. So, of course, she was right. But that doesn't mean, it doesn't mean it's something you want to see. The main, reason, the main reason that people are going to food banks is because there are delays with pay and benefits and there have been changes to social security with the pernicious Tory welfare reforms which have cut money to people with disabilities. They've cut money to the children whose parents have been bereaved. They've cut money to any third or fourth or fifth child uh, in a family unless the mother can prove that she was raped when that child was conceived. And if we give the Tories a bigger mandate in this election, we can see this get even worse. There'll be more people in food banks. Okay. We've got to stop them. <laughs> about industry being the um, main way of us avoiding the use of food banks. However, what happens when those people using the food banks are your public sector workers, in where work, industry yeah. isn't necessarily the answer? We seem to have stopped caring, firstly, about those that need caring for, and secondly, for the people that care for those people. And we seem to have no answer to that currently, what we're going to do. OK, we said in the third row. I haven't visited a food bank before, but I have known people that have. And the vast majority of them that do go for free food smoke, drink, and have Sky Television. What? And that is the truth. Some people use food well, banks who in work. Who, who took it? Somebody disagreed with him here. Who was disagreeing? Oh, you're disagreeing. I up there. OK, you disagree. Far away. I totally disagree. Last night I travelled through Wigan Town Centre to Hindley and I saw ten people sitting in doorways, obviously not watching Sky. The, the benefit system, as we, we all refer to it, is the main reason people are falling out of society yeah. and living on the streets. Yeah. There's been an exponential increase in homelessness and it's a purposely aimed policy and you are part of the party responsible. It's, it's per sorry, it's, per it's, it's on purpose, you say, to Can achieve... Can you give me another explanation? I I'm asking your explanation. Well, I'm telling you, it's a purposely designed policy of creating more dis dismay and discomfort. And this man is not an unintelligent man, and he knows what's going on. You want to answer that? Well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just astonished. I mean, the, you know, the party that introduced the living wage, which is actually raising people's wages, the party that, the party that in creating a welfare system that's trying to get, give people incentive to get, to get back to work, and work is the answer, I'm afraid, at the end of the day. How do you people explain stand, the homelessness? People, 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 people standing the up for themselves. That's yeah. a really good and so, point, and, so. Uh, Of course there's a homeless problem, and we have to and deal with that growing, too. And it's growing, it's growing. Well, and we've been, we've been building more houses to help with that too, 313,000 houses in the last few Why years. Why is it growing then? Uh, because right. you know, that's what we have to do. Rebecca Long-Bailey. 
Well, look, we're in Wigan tonight, and I'm sure many of the audience members have read the famous book, The Road to Wigan Pier, by George Orwell, where in the 1930s he travelled across the country to see how people, often in work, were living in destitution. Well, there's a group of people recreating his footsteps, and recently they visited a Staffordshire food bank. And in that food bank, they met a man who walked seven miles every day to work. He was on a zero-hours contract, often turned away and had to walk all the way back home again. He was 50 years of age and he'd spent 15 years fighting for Britain in the armed forces. He'd given his life to this country. Yeah. Now, is this the kind of Britain he deserves, where he's forced to rely on charity? I think it's absolutely shameful that we have food banks on our streets, that we aren't building an economy that will keep people sustained, that we've got a government that hands out tax breaks to a wealthy elite whilst cutting the benefits for the most vulnerable in society. And I agree wholeheartedly with the comments made about investment in business and industry to create those high-paid, high-skilled jobs of the future. But unfortunately, this government isn't delivering that. We're one of the lowest countries in the OECD in terms of investment in industry and innovation at 1.7% of GDP. Our competitors around the world are on 3%. So to deliver the economy that this country deserves and to share the wealth equally around the regions and nations, we need to elect a Labour government so that we can invest in our future. Paul. Paul. Paul, Paul Matthew. Yeah, I mean, th quite clearly there is a problem with homelessness uh, in, this, in this country. Uh, there's lots of issues surrounding why people end up homeless, mental health issues, uh, there can be issues around al alcoholism, drugs, uh, but obviously people being put out of work as well. Clearly there isn't enough houses in Britain. The problem that we've got is that we've had a massive population boom, and that does go back to the issue of how many people uh, come to this country, but equally we haven't built enough houses over the years. We need a real council house <coughs> building programme. We're not building enough. And and, you know, we're sitting here, we're sitting here in Wigan tonight. This is part of my constituency. I'm an MEP uh, for the North West. And I just feel as if we've been left behind because everything in this country, all of the money, everything gets spent in London. What we want to see... <laughs> what we want to see is not only real devolved power, but devolved finance as well. You know, the Tories had this northern powerhouse or this industrial strategy. It, it, it's complete codswallop. What we need to do is ensure... For, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example, just before I finish. In London, they're spending £5,000 per head on infrastructure. In the north-east of England, it's about £400. We need to get the money out of London. We need to get it out to places like the north-west of England. OK. <laughs> I'll take, I'll take, I'll take this... One point from the woman in the third row there, and then we'll go on to another question. Yes, from you. The issue with food banks, and you say it's about job creation, you say it's about industry. Surely this is just going to get worse, because with artificial intelligence, jobs in the service sector now are going to be impacted. Anything that's repeatable, a robot can do it. Jorgen? Yeah, well, you really, really raise a, a, a very good point here, and this is exactly why we need a much stronger focus on investing in innovation than R&D. Mm. Because actually my calculation is, is that as long as we invest very well, we can actually create more jobs <coughs> than we displace through the implementation of these technologies. But we have to, with that, create the new industries. We have to create, instead of having the manufacturing jobs, it will be jobs who are writing software, who are creating the artificial intelligence. We have to create new jobs in technologies like additive manufacturing. Here in Wigan, there are some companies which are creating brand new textiles in a new textile industry. And more of that can create more jobs, highly paid jobs, more tax, tax income, which will pay for more welfare if we need it also. OK. <laughs> I, I, said, um, I, I said earlier on, when, when it was briefly mentioned by one or two of you, that we'd come to the NHS, which we will, Rebecca Crabtree with a rather different take on the usual questions we get on the NHS. Rebecca. As a portrayed saviour of the NHS, how does the Labour Party plan to combat an NHS culture of wastage, inefficiency and poor management structure? OK, it's a question that 
everybody around this, uh, around this table uh, must face. Paul Nuttall, what do you say to it? Well, you were talking just now. I, no, go on, you start. No, 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 go on. All right, you first. David Davis. <laughs> <laughs> While you have a chance to think, Paul. <laughs> well, the question is, obviously behind Rebecca's question, is that the NHS is, has a culture of wastage and efficiency and poor management. That's your point, isn't it? Yeah. It's no good just putting money into it. Well, I mean, you've got to start by putting money into it. I mean, the simple truth of the matter is people are getting older, the demands on the health service are getting greater, you have high, more high-tech medicine to be delivered, which is expensive, so you do have to put money in, and that starts, I'm afraid, with the, back with the economy. If you don't deliver the money, if you don't have enough money created in the economy, you can't do it. Uh, then we put the money in, we put in uh, 10 billion so far, we're talking about your 350 million a week, whatever it is, 10 billion, which is more than the Labour Party uh, actually promised at the last, uh, the last election. And out of that, in truth, to be fair, I mean, to, to talk about inefficiency, the health service is actually delivering, according to independent reviews, better major care, better outcomes than two, three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. So I think we should be fair to the health service. It is doing a very good job. It still is a world leader in many respects. Now, beyond that, we've still got to keep innovating. And we, we've got a, a, a proposal of sustainability and trans, uh, transformation partnerships, which we are proposing, which will actually improve delivery on the ground. Labour are opposing it, even though they supported it uh, six months ago, uh, but that sort of reform will deliver better outcomes again. They're improving already, but they will improve even All right. further. Uh, Rebecca, you come back to your question. Yeah, I think you're missing the point that just putting money into something is not the solution. A lot of the money is being wasted because we haven't got enough nurses, we haven't got enough midwives, and the money is being wasted on agency staff who get paid approximately three times the wage that a... Uh, <laughs> can I just say, that is what I mean about inefficiency in the NHS. It's not run like a business. It's not run like a business. No. Rebecca Long-Bailey, you're putting, you say you're putting money into the NHS, but it's not run like a business and the money will be wasted. That's what Rebecca said. Well, there's been a narrative uh, put out about the NHS for some time in terms of inefficiency and wastage. And of course, there can always be changes made to make systems more efficient, etc, etc. But it seems it's come out of Jeremy Hunt's playbook. Let's remember he co-authored a book that called for the privatisation of the NHS. So we know where the rhetoric's coming from and we know what his agenda is. And the simple fact is this. The picture of the child lying on two plastic chairs in an A&E corridor haunts me and it haunts many people in this audience, I'm sure, because that's the extent of the NHS crisis. We've got over one million vulnerable people who can't look after themselves because of cuts to social care. And let's remember the crisis was of this government's making. They were setting it up for privatisation. They orchestrated a top-down reorganisation, which was a waste of money. It cost £3 billion, and there hasn't been a positive outcome at the end of it. Can you They're point to any privatisation? £22 billion pound privatization? in efficiency savings. They cut £600 million from mental health and £4.6 billion from social care. Can they you... are driving <coughs> into the sea. Can you answer, can you answer David Davis' can, can question? You, can you point to it? Because, you see, the rate of use of uh, non-NHS non health care was much higher, the growth rate was much higher under, under Tony Blair's Labour than it has been under the Conservative and Coalition governments. So how can you point to this as supposedly some sort of privatisation initiative? Look, Jeremy, there are no, Jeremy, there are no your facts, health sector there are no is facts behind your argument. On this, David. I'd read the book if you haven't had a look at it already, because I'm it points facts. towards creating an American-based insurance system that's privatised. And we haven't got it. That's not well, what we have. What we, have a health, we have a health care system towards, in this country. I mean, the, the lady quite properly raised the issue of the demand on the health service. 11,000 more doctors, over 12,000 more nurses and midwives. Uh, since uh, we've been in power. That's not been a, a privatisation. That's been public money put in for public service, delivering right, yeah. better outcomes for people for suffering Jürgen. major diseases. Well, you've Jürgen. Jürgen. No, 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 Jürgen, 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 please. Well, yeah. well I, I, I watch this programme pretty much every week, and it seems like we have the same debate uh, yeah. every week. And, uh, and, and I don't think we're going to resolve it by saying, you know, we need to throw many more billions into the service, which is exactly the point that you are uh, asking. I think there is a fundamental issue here, and when I compare the national health system here 
to that I've experienced in Germany and Austria. A fundamental difference is that we just do not put the focus on preventative health. And what that means is that our hospitals, our health service is just overloaded so that they don't have any time to actually sort out their efficiencies, which is your point. Now, I do think there is a solution here, and the solution is potentially happening right here in Greater Manchester. And here is going to be one of the first evolved city regions where there is going to be the funding for both social care and the national health system is going to be under one responsibility. And that is the first time that there will really be an incentive in the system to make sure that we do more preventative medicine, to make sure that people don't end up in hospital and don't end up with the actual social care, after care type of issues. Okay. And I think that's the way that we've got to go to get more efficiency. A, a brief, a very brief one. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As, as its workers and that is the only thing that this government is not putting money into one percent pay rise again this year mm. uh, so that's for the next for the last seven years we've had one percent which is devaluing nurses wages it's encouraging people to go on banks and, and to go into agencies to leave the country right. okay. we have a shortage of doctors <coughs> and a shortage of nurses but you will not give us a pay rise oh. Paul By, by my clock, uh, we only have a couple of minutes left. So if you okay, could do it I, I mean, the first thing that you could do, which is just complete common sense, is merge social care and health care. Because, <coughs> you know, in January, there was a million people who were lying on hospital beds who couldn't leave because they had nowhere else to go. It's insane. The problem that we've got is that when Labour came to power in 1997, we were spending £33 billion a year on the NHS. When they left, we were spending £99 billion. The problem is they stuffed the NHS full of pen pushers, bureaucrats and managers. OK? <laughs> right. um, okay. Liam. What? Le no, I'll I'll stop I'll you, Paul, because... Liam. He wants to privatise the NHS. Hang on. He said yeah. in the past Hang he on. wants to privatise the NHS. Hang on. Hang Our on. NHS needs defending. It is at risk of privatisation. It has been undefended. I agree with the points that have been made about staff. There is waste in terms of agency staff and locums. And what needs to happen is investment in staff. Isn't it interesting that those on the top of the pay grade get decent pay increases, while those at the bottom are the ones who've had the pay freeze? OK. Very, very quickly, very quickly, so we've had 30 seconds left. Yes, you. I think a lot of the problem is this streamlining that they're trying to do with the NHS now, like that little boy, who knows, he might have been waiting for a bed in another district general because there was no bed in his hospital yeah. that he was in the A&E for because they've closed paediatric inpatient beds at that hospital and moved it to a different one and they're waiting on an ambulance to transfer him. This is the streamlining that's causing backlog of patients in A&E, which is causing the press. OK, and a brief point at the very, very back there and then we'll stop. Yes. I think the main issue that we've got, and we're just bypassing it completely, is the amount of people that are actually in this country. We are a very, very tiny country with too many people in, and the funding with the NHS does not recognise that. So as Paul just noticed then with the Labour with Tony Blair, who opened our borders, and that rose dramatically, so how are we going to do that? You're people more likely don't to have an immigrant. In the NHS. You're, you're people more likely don't want to work have in the NHS because yeah. they yeah. 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 so much pressure. No. That's more... why they don't want to okay, work Leah. in the NHS. They don't no, want to work in that sector. No, you can't we've, come back. we've got a shortage of doctors. <laughs> we need because more they don't immigrant want to work in that doctors to come and work in our sector. As Jürgen said, we're always debating this on question time, and as so often we run out of time before we've been able to get right through everybody who's got their hands up and apologies to those who wanted to speak on that but our time is up we're going to be in edinburgh next week and in norwich the week after so come and join us there edinburgh and norwich on the screen is the website and also the number to apply to 0330123 if you're listening on five live on medium wave if you're able to get it which i never can uh, the debate carries on on question time extra time until the early hours of the morning and very Exciting and vivid it is when you do catch it. Um, my thanks to our panel here, of course, and to all of you who came to Wigan to take part tonight in this edition of Question Time. And until next Thursday, good night. <laughs>